today today is april 6th 2022 and this is the first session of the third track on environmental disasters and we are interested today in getting our starting session uh, addressed by great stalwarts who have worked for decades in this field and of course i know karen mo very well for last uh, at least 25 30 years and uh, i have lost contact in between but but that's long that long ago i have associated so i feel spe specially proud to introduce our two speakers today our two speakers are Karen Mo and Dave Jones, and they both are closely tied in the Earth Science Information Partner Initiative Cluster and the groups that monitor various aspects of environmental disasters. I would like to uh, request the audience to hear me out for one minute on my experience in the earth science program. It began in 1972 when ERTS 1 and 2 were launched by NASA. In their band selection process, I was involved and the bands were selected based on radiative transfer calculations based on S. Chandrasekhar's radiative transfer model normally used in stellar transformations. But uh, Having done that from University of Michigan's Willoran Lab, IRIM, um, which was under contract from NASA for a year, I was there. I moved on and these became Landsats. And today we are in Landsat 9, 10 or 11 that Karen and Dave are going to update us. And three big satellites that are known to everybody as Terra, Aqua and CAM and carrying multi-spectral scanners with 30, 40, 20 bands, and also other sensors in IR. And some of the satellites carry microwave and radar, but not all. So with all these constellations <coughs> of space platforms, which the program Karen led us to, Karen was program director or, or head at Na NASA Goddard. She was supported by people like associate administrator of NASA and then project managers like Rama, Rama Priyan and many other contractors like us supporting her. Lots of PhDs working on that program. It took a lot of coding in C++ in that time later in Java, etc. I can go on and on, but it gives me great pleasure to introduce you, Karen Mo and Dave Jones. And I think I'll be forced to stop. Otherwise, Ken will snatch away my audio. <laughs> so with that, oh, Gary, welcome. Gary Cross has joined us. So Karen or Dave, please. Uh, your bios are on our website. I can't read them, otherwise it will take 20 out of 90 minutes. So we want to give you time to speak. Oh, great. Thank you. Well, that, that sounds great. I, I just started to share my screen. Just want to confirm that everybody can see it okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, that's, uh, that's terrific. Well, um, thanks so much, uh, Ravi. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And, and Karen and I uh, both co-chair uh, the ESIP Disaster Lifecycle Cluster, uh, which has been going on for uh, many years. And we look at data that addresses disasters uh, from its collection to its curation to its offering. And and then uh, we really have been focusing on how to put that data to work in decision-making environments. So if you think about it, uh, it's, uh, it's sort of about uh, the last mile, delivering data that can really empower decision-makers uh, and in some cases make rapid 30-second decisions. And we're finding a lot of interesting things as we go through uh, this um, 
uh, this time in the disaster lifecycle cluster. And then also at Storm Center Communications, which is my company, uh, as we talk with potential customers about what they need in a data sharing and collaboration environment and uh, the doors it opens for data. So the way that we figure we would do this briefing is that I'll go through some slides and uh, then Karen will, will pick up and go through some more slides. And then uh, uh, I'll talk a little bit and then introduce um, some clusters within ESIP. We have Bob Downs with us uh, from the um, information quality, uh, data quality cluster. And um, Bob is going to give us sort of a lightning talk about uh, what they're doing uh, that could be supportive to efforts that we have going on within the disaster lifecycle cluster, focusing on wildfires. Um, and so I'll talk about our roadmap here in, in just a moment. Uh, but it's, a, it's an honor to be able to present here today. And uh, it's always great to work on extra stuff with Karen. She's so, uh, so smart and engaging. It's great to uh, put these presentations together so we can talk about our passions. Um, so the first slide that I wanted to show here is how the disaster lifecycle cluster focused on uh, creating these things called operational readiness levels and how it evolved into wildfires and, and what we're doing. So this particular slide is of the winter 2020 ESIP meeting, which was in person <laughs> in January, one of the last in-person meetings uh, that we had uh, before the great disruption. And um, we talked about a big idea. That big idea was being driven by a group that we also work with called the All Hazards Consortium, which is a nonprofit organization that has 45,000 uh, plus members, uh, all in the emergency management area and various sectors such as food, fuel, utility, uh, transportation, communication sectors. And uh, they have a big challenge for how can they, while being exposed to so much data, how can they understand and trust that data rapidly when they need to make decisions? How many bucket trucks to send into other states to help with power restoration? How many crews should they have on standby to restore power? Things like that. And so we worked with ESIP to come up with these operational readiness levels and to uh, empower 30-second decision-making. The big important quote here, I think, is down the bottom from Tom Moran, the executive director of the All Hazards Consortium, where he says, the sharing of trusted information drives decision-making and shortens response time. Data can support community lifelines efficiently when it has an associated ORL number. ORL means operational readiness level, and it's something that um, Karen and I and the All Hazards Consortium and ESIP have worked together to evolve and it's starting to turn a lot of heads. So, so here's a picture from that winter meeting in person. Uh, you can see Karen explaining the poster uh, to a bunch of attendees who, who came by and wanted to know about ORL levels. And during that period of time uh, for the ESIP meeting, we also had a side meeting. That's what these pictures are in the upper a part of, uh, of the, the picture here, where we invited different sectors to come in, utility and emergency management and others, to talk about how they use data. Do they trust data? What data might not they have access to that they would love to have access to? And so uh, that all became part of um, presentations as well uh, within ESIP, because we're evolving this uh, day by day. Uh, because we're finding out that many organizations, while they would probably like to use data, they don't have the infrastructure or the expertise to access um, certain types of data. And so this is the poster and how it has evolved since 2020. This is the 2021 virtual ESIP poster, where we started to work with accelerating ESIP clusters. Now, the way things work within ESIP is, is really cool. It's a community-driven organization. And so anyone who has a 
passion or idea <clears throat> or something that they think will be um, would gather community support and involvement, they can start a cluster. And so clusters pop up and some of them fade away. Some clusters pop up and remain for a while. And so these are some examples. There's discovery cluster, drone, air quality cluster, community resilience, fair data, uh, DQI, um, community developing community guidelines working group, ag and climate cluster, there's data quality um, cluster, and, uh, and, and many others, the disaster life cycle cluster. And so what we're trying to do is take our big idea from with ORLs and say, how can we work with the clusters that are doing such awesome activities and, and work? And how might we bring that into the disaster life cycle cluster and then expose people that we have connected with? Uh, and I'll show you that within the ESIP ecosystem of innovation, uh, which is coming here shortly. Uh, but even in 2021, we had another great quote from Tom Moran, the All Hazards Consortium Executive Director. He says, there's much data available to help decision makers, but our members are not sure if they can trust it and how to use it. So ESIP and GeoCollaborate can be very powerful combination to put more data to work. So that was very um, motivating, inspiring, uh, to hear a group with so many members who want to use data, but admit that they really don't know how to decipher the data, how to interpret the data. Uh, there are lots of opportunities when you display science data and information for misinterpretation. Uh, and that's kind of the worst, because if you have misinterpretation of data, you might have uh, kicked off the spending of tens, hundreds of thousands, or even millions of dollars on a response uh, that may or might, may not have been necessary. So uh, we're evolving within the ESIP um, disaster lifecycle cluster. And in 2021, we also had a separate session called uh, California Burning, Putting Data to Work. And so what we wanted to do is describe key features of trusted data and identify opportunities to accelerate cross-sector data sharing for decision makers. And so uh, on the right hand side, we, we ran a poll and we asked people, you know, how do you, um, you know, what one or two points pop up when you think about trusted data? And these are, are the words that people came up. It created a, a map, a word map um, that shows uh, the importance of all of this. And it's all very, very uh, important. So we had takeaways from this meeting. Uh, one was uh, to collaborate across agencies before data needs become urgent. Uh, that would really fuel effective interagency and stakeholder holder communication. We all know how federal agencies and state agencies work. Uh, many times they work in silos of excellence and uh, they don't particularly work across those silos. And uh, that makes it very difficult, particularly when we get to the language question, ontologies, um, what different words are used to describe the same thing, which can drive decision makers batty, you know, the, uh, they, they don't know how to understand certain data. We want to accurately and timely um, create information based on trusted data, extend research to operations, and turn that around and give a feedback from operations to research and operations to access. Even though operational decision makers are out there and they may be accessing data, <clears throat> they're probably not accessing enough data and they may not be accessing the data that they really need. We wanna find out who is using data, how are they using it and how is it useful? And then work with, work, work with clusters to accelerate this ESIP ecosystem of innovation. So that has evolved into other meetings that we'll talk to, we'll talk to in just a minute. But I wanted to um, turn this over to Karen so she could talk about how the operational <coughs> readiness levels came together and what those operational readiness levels mean. So Karen, over to you. Yes, thank you, Dave. And uh, thank you, Ravi, for the nice introduction. 
I uh, wanted to give just a, a wee bit of background about how we came up with operational readiness levels. And uh, part of it was based on uh, my experience at NASA with the technology uh, program, in particular, uh, advanced information systems technology. And uh, so we supported the Earth Observing System uh, data and information system. So that's where uh, Rama was uh, a key player uh, and uh, reporting to Martha Maiden at headquarters for uh, the, the very complex data system that we were building in the 1990s uh, and early 2000s. And uh, that system has evolved to be really very uh, significant to this day in really moving the data uh, into the hands of researchers. Uh, a lot of my work with um, the Earth Science Technology Office uh, focused on assessing technology in terms of its maturity and its usability uh, in, in certain environments. And of course, a lot of the technology was going into spacecraft. Uh, much of it was uh, in processing uh, the data and in supporting people doing uh, modeling and forecasting. So what we wanted to do was to take something that we at NASA had been using for several years uh, to assess technology maturity and turn it into something to indicate to users who may not have a depth of knowledge about the data, but want to use it for data-driven decision-making. How, do uh, how do we give them that kind of information that this is trusted data and that this data is appropriate for certain kinds of use? So a lot of the work that we have done with the All Hazards Consortium has been pulled together by looking at use cases. What problem are the people trying to solve? And um, so I've been involved with the All Hazards uh, Consortium and their sensitive information uh, uh, sharing environment. And, and that effort has really um, helped me under, understand how to look at data from a point of view of needing the information and wanting to know how to act on that information without needing to know all of the scientific data uh, background about it. And so we felt that um, uh, for today's talk, that this was uh, quite an appropriate uh, challenge for ontologies. So that's um, kind of the history about why we developed the operational readiness levels. Um, and Dave had mentioned about accelerating the research to operations. And of course at NASA, uh, there, there are offices um, uh, dealing with applied sciences to, to make uh, data uh, or to really demonstrate how data can be more operationally used uh, in a wide range of applications. And we are leveraging that, uh, especially as you'll see later in uh, addressing wildfires, which has been a focus uh, for the last uh, year and will continue uh, for the next year. So we use the ORLs to introduce these new data products, uh, you will see a demonstration of uh, GeoCollaborate uh, and to show how uh, the All Hazards Consortium, which uh, works extensively with their fleets, uh, uh, the, the trucks that go out to respond to disasters. Um, initially, we've looked at weather disasters, hurricanes, um, uh, power losses, and how do you get the fleets in the right place ready to bring uh, those power services back up to speed. And, the, uh, and that, that is the group that Tom Moran uh, heads up and provided this uh, great insight into uh, his understanding, uh, which is really key as an end user, uh, the importance of data-driven decision-making. So um, 
we wanted to have a mechanism for maturing operational data. So technically this data might be uh, quite mature, but there are steps we need to take to educate the user community and to get them comfortable. Uh, it is the user community which actually associates an ORL number to um, a particular data product uh, for themselves, for their, their own use, but also for their community's use. And most importantly, uh, ORLs provide that confirmation to a non-technical decision maker. The data is trusted, it's credible. Uh, and I think our next chart will uh, take, uh, okay, here we have uh, this quote from Tom Moran. Um, I might say that, that Tom's group includes a number of people from uh, FEMA, from uh, DHS, and uh, they are thrilled to have a public-private uh, consortium, the All Hazards Consortium, uh, putting forth these operational readiness levels. And uh, we currently now serve uh, this group in uh, supporting the technical aspects of the operational readiness levels. But it is indeed uh, the members of the user community who are using uh, these processes uh, to identify their trusted data and the level of use that's associated with that trust. So Tom says we need the ability for non-technical decision makers to rapidly assess the impacts of their system or business and move forward with small and big decisions, sometimes really big. So they must have trust in the information that is driving their decisions. And Tom gives a story about uh, the cost of the fleet movement crews can be up to a million dollars a day. And if they're in the wrong place or stuck and not able to get to the right place, uh, that is a, a huge uh, financial impact, uh, not to even discount the loss of power and, and risks associated therein. So uh, the next chart gives the ORL model decision tree. Uh, this chart was uh, developed by Carrie Hicks. She was formerly with uh, Duke Power and uh, with their GIS uh, group. So she was a senior GIS le lead there. Uh, and she continues to work with the All Hazard Consortium in evolving and, and uh, helping the community uh, use this tree to uh, identify trusted data. So the first uh, top level here, it says trusted embedded source. And if it's not a trusted embedded source, it does not get an ORL ranking. Uh, she uses as an example, a uh, gas buddy. Uh, it's uh, a um, crowd resourced uh, kind of data set that lets people know that if you need to gas up your car during a storm when a lot of uh, energy uh, systems are, are out, uh, where to go. Uh, and they were using it for the fleet uh, movement, but uh, determined that use it at your own risk. It is, it is not a trusted data source. It may tell you that there's gas at a gas station, diesel fuel, fuel but uh, that might not be the case. Uh, but as you go further down, uh, the column uh, in blue that goes down to ORL1 identifies some of the main uh, data system uh, elements that need to be present for an ORL rating. Uh, the uh, things like um, that it is uh, on a secure, uh, available through a, a secure uh, web link, uh, that it has interoperability uh, capabilities so that you can uh, quickly pick it up. Uh, that there is someone you can reach out to if you have a question about the data, a number of different factors there. And then the extent and latency for use, for the use case, and the resolution, temporal, spatial resolution, the kind of things that uh, people certainly in the uh, 
remote sensing world uh, spend a lot of attention on. Those uh, areas in green are related to specific use cases. And so you might have a very robust data set, but if its uh, timeliness is not fully adequate, uh, it won't make it into an ORL1. However, it's very important to know that all levels of operational uh, uh, ORLs are valid, trusted data. Uh, if you go to the next slide, um, we show that um, we use this uh, uh, designation where ORL1 is uh, the highest level of uh, operational readiness, uh, going down to level four. Uh, we have worked this with the Earth Science Information Partners. So we have the ESIP symbol in the uh, center of, the, uh, of, of these um, uh, designation icons. And uh, this becomes a, a useful mechanism uh, when you start laying this information into a, a GIS system. Uh, the next chart is a tool that was developed by Kiri to make it uh, easy to walk through with uh, potentially uh, a technical community, but one uh, that is not directly associated with the data itself. So they're, they're, uh, the data is, is not necessarily um, their, their forte, but uh, they, people on the team who are uh, providing these rankings uh, do have that GIS background. So all of the major electric companies, for example, are, uh, are very, um, uh, they, they, they're very facile in their use of, of the data. And uh, they do this as a group and, uh, and assign these levels. The uh, next chart, then uh, we, we can give you a couple of uh, YouTube videos that um, uh, where uh, some of the all hazards community uh, members have uh, uh, put together training uh, packages, uh, short videos uh, for their community. And um, I think these will be uh, made available uh, to you so that you can uh, get a little more uh, in-depth uh, as to um, how the All Hazards uh, Consortium has embraced and, and used this technology. And uh, uh, people at the uh, Homeland Security are looking to the All Hazards Consortium to help uh, develop some uh, standards, as, as I understand it, eventually that uh, DHS and uh, FEMA uh, can go forward with uh, for trusted data. Um, the next chart, then I have some examples of uh, these different levels. Uh, ORL1, as I said, is the uh, uh, most uh, trusted uh, for both its uh, usability, its operational readiness, and its applicability to a use case. And this, uh, these, this set has been uh, put together uh, to illustrate examples for fire, wildfires. So this is a Veers product uh, showing uh, uh, heat and wildfire uh, uh, outlines, uh, the, the intensity. And uh, its use would be for uh, smoke jumpers, especially when they're going into uh, densely forested areas that are being overtaken by um, uh, by the, the, the wildfire and of course uh, their lives depend depend on um, uh, getting uh, an accurate and uh, 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 excellent spot at which to enter the fire to fight it. Uh, the next chart, the next uh, ORL2, is uh, the long-term drought outlook. This is a climate uh, prediction product from uh, NOAA's, one of NOAA's NOAA offices. And uh, because it is a, a, a long-term product and not real-time, um, 
its usability then uh, uh, would be for uh, that kind of, of application, but would help uh, people who are in doing water management or uh, doing some assessments of uh, risk damage. Uh, the ORL3 example is uh, a suite uh, of sensors on an island in New Zealand. In uh, 2019, this uh, volcano had uh, unexpectedly erupted. However, the, uh, the seismic sensors around the uh, perimeter had the data, uh, but the uh, tour companies did not have that information. And tragically, uh, there was a tour, uh, tour group uh, and many people lost their lives um, because of that lack of information. Uh, the ORL4 example is uh, the flood maps that are being developed. Uh, again, this is a kind of a joint NASA NOAA product um, where these maps are collecting, uh, integrating data from uh, several satellites uh, as a daily product. And uh, the, uh, this uh, flood information is, is really very important for uh, the fleet utility vehicles uh, when they are um, trying to repair damage from um, from hurricane and flooding damage and their restoration priorities. So it just kind of gives you a, a snapshot. Um, and so I think at this point, we're ready to uh, uh, show you an example of the uh, operational readiness levels uh, in, in work with uh, the dashboard, uh, which is uh, uh, the GeoCollaborate uh, infrastructure that uh, I think Dave is going to take over at this point. Well, no, I guess not yet. <laughs> uh, so anyway, I wanted to mention that you will get uh, this demo in a, in a couple of minutes. Uh, but you can see here that uh, the ORL uh, labels are, are put into place uh, on the operational system. Uh, and the next slide. There's where I take it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is, this is great. Um, uh, and uh, what I was going to do here, uh, Karen's description of ORLs, I mean, she's been so involved in evolving those, been really, um, really terrific. And I'm going to just, uh, I'll turn my video on there uh, and then uh, switch over uh, here. There we go. Um, Karen described the evolution of ORLs and how they're being used and how we're really getting that feedback from the All Hazards Consortium members. We've had interest from DHS, Department of Homeland Security and FEMA uh, on these ORL numbers and how they might be able to accelerate trust and data and decision-making. Um, within ESIP and the Disaster Lifecycle Cluster, we've also come up with the ESIP ecosystem of innovation. And this is really exciting because uh, through the relationships that we've developed, uh, whether it's through the disaster lifecycle cluster or users of GeoCollaborate, uh, on the right-hand side, you see all of these different agencies and organizations uh, that we have touched through GeoCollaborate that creates the plumbing, if you will, the, the, uh, the way in which we can deliver science data. And so now we want to um, invite people within the ESIP Federation, clusters and individuals to come and say, we have something that might be of value. We're working on an approach. We're working on um, a vocabulary database, or we're working on air quality issues. And we want to see how we can bring those in, process that information, and then deliver it into these decision-making environments, whether they're agencies, the state of Florida, or you know, communities, NASA. And, and, and you're probably seeing already a model developing that could be implemented to help agencies 
place more of their data in front of decision makers and then get feedback on whether those products are useful, how they can be improved, does the data latency need to be addressed? Um, and you know, it's very, very tough for agencies to get a lot of feedback on the products that they're offering. A lot of agencies just get criticisms uh, if people don't like using the data, uh, but there's no formal way of providing that, that feedback. So, so this ecosystem of innovation creates this environment uh, for ideas and placing those into the disaster lifecycle cluster so we can then uh, incubate them, uh, get them out in, in front of these organizations. And so uh, the next slide here uh, goes into a specific <coughs> example of trusted data for assessing risk, response, and, and resilience, where uh, we are working to place, uh, geo-collaborate in front of communities in a wildfire, initially a wildfire scenario so we can leverage data from federal sources, non-governmental organizations, private sector data, and out of the ESIP collaboratory, um, which is uh, community driven uh, by ESIP members, and then take that data and place it in front of community members who are looking to make their communities more resilient, whether it's during pre-fire, whether it's during, you know, active wildfire response or post-fire activities where data is very important as well, assessing risk for landslides and debris flows. And, you know, whenever rain moves into that area that's been impacted and has a burn scar. So uh, the example you see here in the, in the bottom is of a satellite data uh, downscaled uh, to 375 meter fire temperature RGB product uh, that could go out and help to uh, let communities know the vulnerability they have to protect perhaps uh, wildfires. This is a big one I'll talk about here in just a moment. But the whole idea of the, the, the ecosystem of innovation is to improve community access and youth use of earth science data. We know that most community members don't have expertise in, in uh, much less science, but also using science data. Uh, and so we're, we're, we know we're gonna introduce a new challenge and that is the use of language uh, in uh, science data sets going into communities. So we believe that the ORLs that Karen just described will help evolve the ESIP ecosystem of innovation. Mm -hmm. It'll help us focus on identifying evolving data sources and then linking them to use cases. Uh, it allows us to reach into the automated intelligence world and machine learning world uh, and to test products in front of decision makers and even the public. Um, it involves users in the product development life cycle. So we want to have that feedback as to whether these products are useful or not. And, uh, and also that gets back into the product developer and then transition the data uh, into operations as a service in a phased approach. Uh, so people are all familiar with this data. Oh yeah, we worked on it. We, we actually evaluated this. We looked at, gave them feedback. Wow, now look at this product. Yeah, we want to resource. Uh, we want that as a resource and want to use it every day. So, um, so essentially, this is how we're approaching uh, taking science data and putting in front of communities. And we've talked also about how we're going to get ESIP clusters involved. And so we have a period of time right now where we're gonna take uh, to hear from some of these ESIP clusters in a lightning presentation. Uh, this is the same presentation uh, approach that we used for our ESIP winter meeting this past January for wildfires, uh, especially pre-wildfires. And we're really fortunate to have Bob Downs with us from uh, CDAC, a Socioeconomic Data Application Center. Uh, Bob is also very, very active in the information quality and many other clusters within ESIP. Um, and so Bob is going to give us a briefing live, uh, and then we'll go to three other briefings that are about uh, four minutes long. So you can see what they're doing, and I'll be playing back their recordings from the ESIP winter meeting. Hopefully it will be relatively seamless 
and we'll have no issues. So what I'd like to do now is, um, uh, Bob, I wanted to ask you, do you have your uh, slides? Yes. Uh, okay. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'll let you pull up your screen and slides so you can uh, share. So, uh, Bob, it's all yours. Okay. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see. Oh, great. Uh, so, uh, I'm uh, speaking today on behalf of the in Information Quality Cluster, the ESIP Information Quality Cluster, and um, I'm going to give you some information quality perspectives on wildfires. My co-authors are the members of the leadership team of the Information Quality Cluster, including Ampapuram Ramapriam, Pang, Yaxing Wei, and David Moroni, who's here with us today. Um, and uh, uh, this is based on, uh, as Dave uh, was saying, on the uh, presentations we, we gave uh, last, uh, of, um, uh, well, in the winter, uh, seems so, so long ago. A anyway, uh, we tend to take a look at all the stages of uh, a, a wildfire from prevention, where uh, we definitely need information about the combustibles and brush and dry grass, et cetera, and uh, look at how we might be able to repair in terms of the data needs there, where we need uh, population estimates, who's at, who, who's at risk and their locations, and the proximity of these combustibles and the access to fire propagation models, et cetera, as well as locations and the volume of water and travel time, et cetera. And, and uh, certainly the firefighting resources uh, and uh, also need to know about our information coverage, uh, insurance coverage and uh, the results of actual area of studies, et cetera. Getting into the response stage, we also need to have those population estimates and locations as well as knowing where the road locations are and the conditions, the current conditions, which goes to the timeliness of the information. We also need to have uh, the locations of the volume and volumes of water, as well as the firefighting resources and travel times, et cetera, as well as the nearest medical facilities. And then looking at the recovery stage, we need to know about the availability of the skilled people who uh, are going to be needed to help uh, and the estimates of uh, the cost for all of this, as well as uh, the insurance information. And so, the accurate, timely, accessible, and reliable, easy to use information is critical at each of these stages. And these will help to ensure the availability of such information is, is a key pre-wildfire uh, challenge. We also take a, a, a data set life cycle perspective when looking at the implications for wildfires. And so looking at the aspects of information quality throughout the uh, data set life cycle, we see that with science quality, you, you need to have the accuracy and the precision and the certainty and validity, as well as knowing about the suitability or fitness for purpose of the data. When we get into product quality, uh, we need to know about how good that data is in terms of uh, the uh, documentation how accurate and complete and up-to-date the metadata and the documentation are, as well as the formats and associated information, including provenance. And then we also need to know about the stewardship quality, how well the data are being managed and preserved. And then lastly, looking at the service quality, how easy it is for users to discover, understand, and trust, as Karen and Dave were saying, and use given data product along with its metadata. And this has got to be available in, in terms of the requisite knowledge base and, and the people who are going to be using it. Um, so for us, the potential users really need to know about the quality of the data sets and information that they plan to use. And it's especially critical for the data and information that are used for when preventing, preparing, responding to and recovering from wildfires and other disasters. So uh, the bottom line is all required information elements should pay attention to and be judged by these aspects of information quality. And I wanna 
uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dave. We'll have some questions at the end. Yeah, that's uh, that sounds great. And uh, Bob, we'll, we'll have those questions. What I want to do now is to uh, appreciate that that uh, live presentation. And now what I'm going to do is uh, share uh, videos. Uh, the first one is going to be from Douglas Rao, who is uh, going to talk about uh, data readiness. And uh, I'll pull him up right here and uh, hopefully it will play with no problem. We did a test uh, and here we go. Thanks, um, Dave. So I'm here presenting on behalf of the data readiness cluster within ESIP and with my co-chair Tyler Christensen, who is um, in this session as well. And with data readiness cluster, we are not focusing on specific use case, very uh, one specific use case, but we are looking at how we can um, focus on the readiness for the AI applications. So um, AI has been a power tool for many of the uh, earth science applications and use cases, like in yesterday's workshop, that AI machine learning has been mentioned several times as well. So the focus of the current um, data readiness cluster is to how we can um, define a data AI readiness level and standards that to allow the users to find the data that's easy to use in the AI and machine learning applications and how the data providers can assess and improve the general usability of the data. So um, in order to achieve that, we are working on several things. The first thing is to define what AI readiness really mean for, uh, for the open environmental data. And we want to specifically focus on the community defined user requirements through a survey that's currently ongoing and uh, identifying what's the tools need to assess the readiness of the environmental and earth science data that for different use cases and um, what's the way to represent the readiness level to allow the easy discovery and access of the data. So ideally we want to publish a formal data standards on AI readiness of the data. So we, as I mentioned, we are currently uh, engaging with the AI machine learning practitioners to define the user requirement for AI ready data. And so there are a lot of data such as the H2R data that uh, Steve mentioned from NOAA that provides the wildfire potentials. So how we can engage with, with, with the wildfire stakeholders to identify those uh, uh, requirements. And for the AI ready data that we have four um, focus, one is on the data preparation, data quality, and data documentation and access. So we produce a draft data readiness, AI readiness a data checklist um, for everyone to look at and uh, provide comments. So you can go to the link on the slides and uh, there are more information you can find for each characteristics within each category of the data readiness for AI applications. So since it's a cross um, cluster collaboration, I just want to use this timeline of our effort on AI ready data to um, provide some um, brainstorming ideas that we can work together. So right now we want uh, moving from the uh, AI ready data survey that to a user focus group to identify the uh, key factors for AI ready data. And with that user group uh, outcomes, we draft the community standards and to develop pilot readiness assessments for, with different data providers like NOAA, NASA, USGS, and the UK Met Office. And the last, the last one, last step, step in the next two years would be use case driven uh, AI and ready data collections to um, coming back to the wildfire applications and with AI can be a powerful tool in this application. So we really want to have engagement uh, with wildfire stakeholders in this case to our user focus group to look at what's the AI ready data means for the wildfire applications and what's the key challenges and uh, what we will also want to do a pilot assessment with those high priority data sets for the wildfire applications, no matter whether it's pre-wildfire, during or post-wildfire. And uh, we can also do in some code development for a collection of AI ready data to empower the AI application development for wildfires. And some potential future activity can be a hackathon or sprint to focus on develop AI applications for wildfire that will require the preparation for AI ready data and also engagement 
with both developers, domain experts, and communities on this topic. Without turning back to Dave. Great, uh, thank you, Douglas. And um, you've seen now two presentations on the data side. Now we're going to bring you uh, two presentations sort of from the, the sensors the sensor side. The first one we're gonna start with is Steve Young, who is giving a presentation about the data quality cluster uh, within ESIP. So Steve, take it away. So hi, I'm Steve Young, and I am stepping in as a co-chair of the air quality cluster. What the air quality cluster does is kind of self-explanatory, I think. So, um, you know, rather than go into that, um, you know, I will just say these are some personal ideas, pretty much, uh, not necessarily representing the uh, cluster as a whole, in fairness. So at the idea front, what do communities need, um, thinking pre-fire, um, we're going to focus on smoke for fairly obvious reasons if, if we're talking air quality here. And I'm going to try not to read all this stuff. The presentation will be available, but um, helping communities, guiding them to available relevant information resources so that they, they have access to that information up front um, is, is going to be important. And uh, I will suggest having deployable resources um, available, you know, kind of planning for this and having them available ready to go could be very important. And, uh, you know, the focus for us at air quality, do you need additional mobile air quality sensors um, that you could get out into the field? Um, do you want to have inventories of air purifiers and potentially other protective equipment for the most vulnerable populations of people, people with asthma, for example? Um, the chief made a really good point yesterday. Uh, he said that for fire response, real-time data isn't necessarily that useful because they're on more of a 24-hour cycle, he said. I will suggest that when we're talking about smoke and sensitive populations, near real-time data are actually pretty important. And also, if there's a, um, for example, a sudden wind shift, if you've got a fire crew out there and the wind suddenly shifts, you'd like to have as much advanced notice that that wind shift is about to hit as you can get, because you might have to get that crew out of there on extremely short notice. So wanted to make that point. Now, a couple of examples of what's happening out there. Purple air is a really interesting, you know, kind of um, community science, hyper local initiative where you can get a low cost air quality sensor Put it up, it connects to internet, similar to Weatherbug for weather data. Um, so that's a really interesting resource that has shown up a lot with the recent wildfires because you could see those elevated levels. There they are, they're showing up on people's sensors. Similarly, NOAA has a really interesting smoke forecasting tool. And I'll tell you during um, last year's fire season, you could see on that that we were getting poor air quality all the way out on the East Coast, uh, transporting across the country from the West Coast fires. So these smoke forecasting tools are potentially very important, you know, and being positioned to take advantage of them. Now, just a little bit on um, some thoughts about deployable sensors. And a lot of this is probably going to, you know, interrelate to what Scotty's about to talk about. So I won't really dwell on the fine points here. But I will mention that dual use uh, could be very important, that if you have sensors that not only allow you to measure air quality on a real-time or near real-time basis, but also the meteorological data, you know, so that you, you might pick up an unexpected shift in uh, wind direction, wind speed from a dual use deployable sensor that happens to have been strategically positioned. So I think, um, you know, the points are probably pretty obvious. And again, Scotty will probably, you know, touch on similar stuff from a much better informed point. So again, could you pre-stage have ready to deploy some of these assets, um, you know, is something to think about. So lightning talk, I think I will 
stop there. And, you know, I look forward to the next round of the talks. Thanks. Okay, and that was Steve Young again with the air quality cluster. And now uh, you heard Steve reference uh, Scotty. So uh, fortunately enough, uh, we do have Scotty Strachan, who is going to talk about uh, the EnviroSensing cluster. This is the last uh, lightning talk for this particular uh, webinar and conversation. And then after this, we'll come back and, and dive a little bit into GeoCollaborate. So uh, here's Scotty, take it away. All right, thank you. Uh, thanks, Dave and company. So yeah, I'm Scotty Strachan. I'm representing the EnviroSensing cluster. This cluster has been around for nearly a decade in ESIP. And this is really a collection of experts from, you could say, grassroots science-based observations and in situ observations. And so this cluster is made up of people from the CZO, NEON, USGS, LTER, uh, uh, NOAA, NASA, EPA, there's there's a whole bunch of people involved in this cluster that have spent an awful lot of time deploying, again, science-based in situ observations. And so we feel like even though we, we were coming from, a, you know, more scientific missions for hydrology, ecology, climate, et cetera, perspective, there's a lot of value, um, and Steve uh, alluded to this, um, when you start to make your deployments multi-mission. So we feel like that's a contribution that our cluster can start to make to the wildfire community. So uh, when we talk about, you know, what are some of the, the science-based uh, things that this community does, um, and which ones are appropriate for wildfire or fire prep detection response and mitigation. Um, yeah, we can talk about the classic uh, uh, remote uh, automated weather system uh, installations and, and things like fuel and soil moisture, um, plant uh, greenness um, in the understory where you can't get to it with remote sensing and things like that. Um, but more importantly, our cluster has really been digging into these issues, not around the wildfire topic, but just data sharing and trusted data in general um, about what are the common software and cyber infrastructure needs to really make data more useful more quickly across these grassroots, again, networks and organizations. Um, we also recognize that the, the next step in, in sort of cutting edge, expanding a point measurement to a watershed scale measurement is integration with UAS born sensors and things like that. And we feel like there's a lot of potential for evaluating, let's say, uh, fine scale fuel and soil moisture characteristics using UAS. So um, there's a, I think there's a lot of potential there. Um, the bottom line for our group also is that networking your sensors is really important and data networks are going to be the key to this whole business of both gathering the data and sharing the data appropriately. So we also feel that there's a training and management gap for implementing sensors and networks at community scale. And this has to do with the fact that you know, this stuff is kind of complex and if you want it to be reliable and trusted over a long period of time, there's best practices that have to be applied. And our group in its early days spent a lot of time on publishing the best practices for sensor networks. So to con conclude this flash presentation, I wanna give the rest of this community an idea of, okay, so when we say science-based, where are the scientists coming from? Why are we deploying these sensor networks? Well, it's not to protect homes and businesses and this sort of thing. I will say that a lot of these networks have come at, and these practices have come out of the need to study things like hydrology, emissions, ecology, and fire process. Um, if you say, what are the wildland fire science components? And then, um, you know, those are overlaying on this concept of a fire continuum. Fire is either um, happening right now or it will happen again soon. And I think this was alluded to earlier um, by our guest speaker. And, and this is, this is definitely true for most of the Western United States. The key to merging this fire continuum and the science is data-driven data -driven cyber infrastructure innovations. And so with that, um, that's just the flash presentation. Thanks again, Dave, for letting us come in here and uh, engage. Well, that sounds great. Thank you, Scotty. And uh, that's what um, you've seen the four clusters 
uh, present. And uh, towards the end here, we'll have uh, questions uh, for Bob. And Bob, I hope you can uh, stick around as well. Um, so what I'm going to do now is uh, dive into uh, a demonstration of GeoCollaborate. And I'm just going to, uh, while I set that up, just going to share uh, this particular uh, screen here. Uh, and and GeoCollaborate, you've heard us refer to uh, before in this webinar, uh, is a real-time data sharing and collaboration platform uh, that we developed through the federal government's Small Business Innovation Research Program. So the SBIR program, some of you may be familiar with that term. And um, uh, we have gone through all of the stages required within SBIR and have now reached phase three status, uh, which basically means that any federal agency can acquire this technology and put it to use to further its research, to further its operations, or uh, to just expand it um, on a sole source basis. So they, they do not have to compete for this technology because the federal government has already invested in it and it has already been competed twice in the early stages of SBIR. So uh, I'm going to uh, stop sharing here and pull up uh, a, um, a, a, web, uh, a website here that's uh, GeoCollaborate for the Fleet Response Working Group. And I thought what I would do is share with all of you who are watching uh, in the chat, I'm going to put a link in the chat so we can make this a little bit uh, interactive. And you'll see that there's a follow link that comes through. Uh, and if, if you see that link and you click on it, uh, then you will see a map pop up. So I'll look at Ravi, I can see your camera is on. If you just give me a thumbs up that you see the, uh, the map load up. Uh, when you click on that link and anybody else who, uh, yeah, Karen's got it. If you guys give me just a little thumbs up on yeah. your video or, I or whatever. It. I got it. You see it, Ravi. Great. Okay. So um, just to let everybody know, you've connected to a web map. This is GeoCollaborate and it's a follower. So I have logged in with credentials and I am going to uh, take the lead and uh, display data sets. I'm going to display uh, a couple of data sets. But when, when you turn GeoCollaborate on, you see the on off switch in the upper left hand corner of the map? Yeah. <clears throat> when you turn GeoCollaborate on, your map is going to zoom out. It's not only going to match my map, but it's going to get all the data sets that I have activated. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's quite crowded with a lot of data. Yes. Uh, in Appalachian area of the East Coast. Exactly. And so what you see displayed are a lot of marine observations. So you see uh, buoys and uh, all that stuff. And I can turn those off and take them off of your display. Mm, I see. Okay, and now what we, we can do is I can control your map. So I can now zoom down into this area of severe weather uh, that happened over the last several days. And you see a lot of symbols like W's and H's and T's. Yes. Well, you can click on those symbols. So oh. we're essentially taking data sets that are trusted and we're delivering them across all platforms in real time. And then you can interrogate those data sets. Wow. So just think about that in the context of trusted data, training, putting prototype products in front of people. And so not only can I give a briefing and use real time data and turn it on and off and, and I'll zoom out here a little bit and I'll turn off the severe weather uh, outlook uh, from uh, the, the weather prediction center and uh, the significant weather. Uh, so I'll turn those colors off 
and maybe I'll go and get a, a, a weather radar uh, image. So, so now... Is that the uh, one in blue? No, the light green. Yes, the green and the blue is actually real-time National Weather Service radar right mm -hmm. now. We see that. Yes. On our so, screen, not on the Zoom screen, but on your desktop. That's right. And that's why I'm not sharing my screen within Zoom because we're actively involved in a collaboration session, not using any technologies like Zoom or, you know, any other platform. Yes. This is a real time data sharing and collaboration environment. And so I'm going to share another, uh, I'm going to pull up another screen and I'm going to share this. Uh, you, can, you can go to it as well, but it's, um, it's the, uh, F, the, the Fleet Response Working Group dashboard. And so this dashboard, I'm going to uh, share my screen here. This dashboard is the same URL that you've gone to, but with just a slash dashboard at the end instead of uh, follow. And you'll see a number of things going on here within GeoCollaborate. So I'm sharing my screen now because I want to point out some things to you. Any of the data sets that I shared in this collaboration session that you connected to as a follower have access to in the dashboard on the left-hand side here. So each individual can turn on and turn off data sets that have been presented to them in a briefing or in an internal or external uh, decision-making collaborative session. The uh, user on every dashboard can also zoom in on any location that they want with the data that we delivered to them. Some of this data could be live data updating every minute, could be earthquake information. Some of it could be forecast data that's updated in periodic times throughout the day. Some could be reports of severe weather, like you see the, the reports of tornadoes. All those red T's are reports of tornadoes in the last 24 hours. And then we have this, this uh, area here called key points, which basically gives people a briefing as to what's going on weather-wise, and because this is focused on the movement of electric utility vehicles, there is no active major response efforts underway. It's called mutual assistance. There's nothing underway. And we keep this uh, key points window updated uh, all the time. And so, so this dashboard has total flexibility for any types of new data sets uh, that might be displayed and also any data sets that they might wanna see, for example. I'll click the six to 10 day temperature outlook. If I click that and then zoom out, this is the six to 10 day temperature outlook from the Climate Prediction Center at NOAA's National Weather Service, where the next six to 10 days are forecast a higher probability to be above average along the East Coast, below average along the West Coast. And, um, and this can be, you can click on that data as well. See, I can inquire on it. It's an 80% chance of temperatures being below normal in this dark purple area. So keep your winter gear out if you're uh, going to be in that section of the country. Dave, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but the immediately things like this come to mind are escape routes from fire hazards, escape routes from hurricane uh, crowding, and uh, so on. There are yes. many uses one can think of if you can keep on improving the geospatial scale. Wonderful. Exactly. And um, you, you sort of have read our minds, Ravi, because uh, having now the capability, I like to call it the plumbing in place, where we can engage anyone at any time with any type of science data and information, uh, we believe that it's going to be a great motivator for data curators and data providers to get their data in a web service type format so it can be accessed easily and shared. So, so we can place everyone on the same map at the same time looking at the same data. We call it a 
collaborative common operating picture. And it's one that has never existed before and why it's, it's gotten to the status that it has within the SBIR program. Uh, it, we actually won an award for one of the most innovative small businesses in the country at the White House from the Small Business Administration for, uh, for this technology. And so I want to now uh, continue with the, uh, oh, first thing, I'm sorry, that I want to point out uh, before I get off the dashboard and the screen saving, uh, screen saver here, is that um, you can see on the left-hand side of the dashboard here, the ORL numbers that are associated with some of these data sets. For example, weather radar is a one. I can click on that symbol and it shows that decision tree that Karen described earlier in this webinar about what makes uh, those ORL numbers valid. What, what process uh, does the data have to go through? And so I'm now going to stop sharing of this screen and start sharing of um, my PowerPoint slide. Sure. And uh, hopefully that will display okay. Yeah, we are okay. Okay, and go into the next um, uh, topic here in the webinar, which is challenges. What are the challenges uh, that we're seeing? And so that's where I'm going to ask Karen to, to uh, sort of lead this conversation. Uh, I may chime in um, uh, at times, uh, but uh, Karen, you can go ahead and take over this one and I'll advance to the next slide. Excellent. Yeah, so uh, we have looked at uh, wildfires and uh, uh, here we show in yellow some key aspects of what uh, people in the community need. Uh, and this was developed by a, a group out in Boulder, uh, Colorado uh, because of the recent fires that they experienced. So um, the ability to have information to the perimeter and the closest town and subdivision to a, a wildfire event. Um, Real-time imagery of the fire and area with weather topography overlaid. A data aggregator, you have to go to so many different places, all those layers on a common map is what they need. So um, this is uh, from a poll where uh, people actually experiencing uh, fire issues uh, very recently have described uh, what their concerns are. The next slide, we've kind of interpreted these challenges. Uh, so Dave, there we go. Um, if you think about uh, the data provider, they're like all over the map and how they're providing data. So um, the data users now, uh, they want data, as you can see from that previous uh, set of comments, uh, but each user is going to have in their mind what it is that they need and, and what uh, they might not know what's available but they have a structured, this is what I'd like. And the private sector would have something different because you would be integrating uh, new data, science data into uh, systems that they already have working uh, to, to do fleet management for the electric sector, uh, to monitor uh, food stores and the like, uh, all of the things that disaster response people do in their uh, in their own circle. And then you have the public who um, are, are needing this uh, actionable information. So the problems we have that we think are very relevant to ontologies, uh, understanding the data and from the data provider's point of view, we need to understand their needs. So it's this uh, lack of, of education uh, you have to build trust in the information and you have to build that understanding, a foundation that the terms are going to be meaningful. So in the next chart, um, 
we think that from the data provider's point of view, uh, the work that Bob talked about and, and Doug's uh, recording about data, uh, data structures and uh, information quality that uh, we also can build on the uh, OGC uh, for uh, geo geographical standards to provide a standard way of providing the data to these different needs. But we also have to use information and uh, a full understanding from these different users. Now their uses are still going to be different and unique, maybe not so unique, but specified for their location and the nature of their disaster. Uh, so a data user, a uh, private sector user and a public user, user uh, can we inform them about the data so that they understand what they can get from the data. And uh, making that transition is, is a tremendous challenge. We do have um, some ideas for starting in the next chart. Um, so the data sharing in the real-time collaborative environment, uh, as, as you saw with uh, the Geo Collaborate, we have a, a superb environment there for letting people sit and watch and provide feedback, uh, data interpretation, uh, really important that uh, they uh, are not misinterpreting what they're seeing. So partly it's what they're seeing, partly what's written about the data, ways of conveying the meaning of the data to different communities. These are our challenges. And the next chart, Dave, I think uh, you were going to take over at this point the opportunities. Sure, absolutely, Karen. Thank you. And so what we're really looking at here is how can we take disparate data sources from different government agencies, different state agencies or private sector organizations and feed that into these data users and how, help them understand the terms that are being used to describe this sort of data. So in a big picture, what we're trying to do here is make it very easy for us, a, a decision maker to access this data on an iPad, on a laptop, on a, de a mobile device, uh, and not see any difference in how the data is displayed, but it's all displayed on this common collaborative uh, operating picture. And they can start to take actions based on excuse me, the data that's being um, uh, put forth by these federal agencies. Here, here's an example. This is a GeoCollaborate dashboard. And uh, this is a picture, an optical image, 30 centimeter optical image from Maxar of the Marshall wildfire in Boulder, Colorado. You can see the fire uh, right there. You can see the smoke blowing over. You know, this is data that could be brought in and in a timely fashion could be of great value. Now, this stepping out a little bit further in a much larger fire, this is the Dixie fire in California on August 5th of 2021. NOAA's polar orbiting uh, satellites, NOAA 20 and also SNPP, uh, gather this uh, data and we can put forth a fire RGB temperature a fire temperature RGB product. This is down sampled from uh, 500 meters to 375 meters, but you can clearly see the fire fronts, how massive they are. And uh, we can identify smoke and where it's moving. And you can also see this arrow where it's pointed to Greenville, California. This is Greenville before the fire and Greenville as that fire was moving through the town. And so if you noticed during the demo that uh, I was giving a few minutes ago, we have a key points window. And that key points window is something where we're really looking for input from this ontology summit and the attendees here and those who will be watching this on video to say, how can we make this linkage uh, in a description of science data uh, to create real-time hyperlinks in words that may or may not be understood by multiple types of decision makers. 
including the public. So for an example, uh, you may not understand or somebody looking at this may not understand when we talk about the next sat NOAA satellite pass will occur at 2.55 p.m. Well, perhaps we can click on that hyperlink and then a little window pops out and defines what a satellite pass is that everyone knows and everyone can be on the same level of understanding. Now we understand there's going to be use case uh, spe specifics, uh, user specifics, but if, uh, if there were an interactive uh, database that cuts across different sectors, uh, for example, FEMA created in 2008, a guide to emergency management and related terms, definitions, concepts, and acronyms. You know, can the Ontology Summit participants point us to best practices for deciphering these FEMA terms? Or, you know, they've all collected this impressive list with multiple definitions and examples of terms. And uh, Karen was looking this over yesterday and found three different definitions for acceptable risk and accident. So how can we move forward to link these terms and integrate them into a test case for connecting with communities? One thing we didn't describe in this webinar was that in the disaster lifecycle cluster, we're taking the steps to place GeoCollaborate in front of communities with a local nonprofit partner who worked with communities to help them become more fireproof, uh, fire resilient, and deliver data through GeoCollaborate into those communities. Well, we know that they're not going to understand science terms, and we're not going to hand type in definitions for every term that we might put in the key points window. So uh, we see an opportunity for really uh, doing uh, relationship uh, vocabularies, relational vocabulary databases uh, to uh, connect ontologies to help people understand their risk. So we know vocabularies need to be tailored to various disasters and response use cases. But what we're really focused on is delivering the end product for actionable information uh, that, it, that is understood widely uh, by the public. And so uh, look at that. With five minutes left, <laughs> we can all take a breath and uh, take a drink of uh, water. Uh, and we'd be happy to uh, take uh, questions. Uh, Bob, thanks for reporting or, or, or presenting live, uh, and uh, you won't be able to ask questions of the ones on tape, uh, but uh, we really hope that this gave you an understanding for what we're doing in the disaster lifecycle cluster with GeoCollaborate and the operational readiness levels. And uh, thanks again for your, you know, for the opportunity uh, to, um, to present to you guys here today. Ravi? Wow. Oh, wow. I just am so thrilled with this and the challenges you have thrown to our community to collaborate with you and with ESIP. And there is a lot one can do. I can see from our previous presentations that have been made in earlier sessions, as well as coming up sessions, that there are many touch points where your already integrative solutions uh, have made an impact and we can do our bit from ontology community. So this is a short thank you to Dave and Karen and Bob, is it? Bob, right? Mm -hmm. Bob Downs. Yes. I'm meeting first time today. Uh, so uh, we are very, very grateful. The excellent group of talks. We'll open it to questions for whatever few minutes we have. We can go for about 10, 15 minutes if everybody is going to be present and request you to kindly start. I have a lot of questions. Some I have put on the chat. Gary had a question. Janet has a question. Hey, Gary. Janet has her hand up. Janet, go ahead, please. Um, yes, thanks. Uh, I um, echo what Robbie was saying. This is fantastic. Um, and it's fantastic, not only for what you've accomplished in your area, but as an example of what for, uh, maybe um, health monitoring and management um, could do as well. So I was wondering about the, um, the 
you know, translation from your field to other fields? Have, have people used the work that you've accomplished, the maturity of this, um, in other uh, you know, economic disaster management, uh, health management? Do you know of anything like that? That was one question. And similarly, um, do you know who has made uh, access, you know, who has made use of your access to the GEO uh, Collaborate? Yes, Th thanks, Janet, for those comments and your and your question. Um, and I'll I'll just be as brief as I can about about the answer. The first is uh, on the health applications. Uh, we are currently involved with the state of Florida. Uh, they have funded us under an innovation grant uh, to perhaps make Geo Collaborate a public facing dashboard for harmful algal blooms. Um, we're looking to see how we can improve. Uh, emergency response to harmful algal blooms. We're working with the Indian River Lagoon uh, National Estuary Program on the east coast of Florida, uh, which encompasses uh, Kennedy Space Center as well. And so, um, you know, because it's a new technology, it's really getting people up to speed rather quickly about the importance of how they curate the data and how they offer the data. Uh, but we're actually working on a webinar series right now uh, that we're going to start next week uh, the second second one on emergency response and harmful algal blooms. And so that's going to be out there. I'll share that link with you, uh, Ravi, so you can share it with the group uh, because sure. you can sign up for it and, and watch that. Um, other area, uh, other people that are using GeoCollaborate include NOAA. NOAA is, uh, has issued four contracts uh, to us to work with uh, the JPSS uh, program, Joint Polar Satellite System program. The Hurricane Research Division is using it. They want to put you a collaborate on the Hurricane aircraft. Um, so when they fly into the storms, they can share data with the ground and do real-time collaborating with scientists on the ground. Uh, the National Water Center, part of the National Water S Weather Service, has used you collaborate to do real-time exercises with states like the state of, uh, of uh, Rhode Island and the state of New York. And also um, the, uh, uh, it, it, it's the GOMO folks, it's the Global Ocean Monitoring and Ob Observing System um, Division of NOAA. They created a task team called the Extreme Events Ocean Observing Task Team. They've adopted GeoCollaborate as a way to bring in disparate NOAA data and keep a track on, uh, keep observations on developing tropical systems uh, so we can identify areas where data needs to be taken, where there might be data gaps. And so those data gaps can identify where they might wanna deploy other sensors prior to a hurricane moving over so they can improve numerical weather prediction models. Um, the uh, DHS, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency is using GeoCollaborate and the US Census Bureau is also using it. They believe it could revolutionize, uh, well, at least improve the accuracy of uh, future census uh, while keeping census uh, enumerators in the field safe. Um, so that's, uh, and then the Fleet Response Working Group is what I demonstrated that, that instance is a nonprofit organization with those 45,000 members. Mm, amazing, wonderful, wonderful work. Thank you. Getty. Okay, I just unmuted. Uh, so I had a few things in the in the uh, chat. I'll just uh, do three of these. One is uh, the idea that this uh, automated intelligence examples would be great to have for our synthesis and our communicate. So maybe we can keep in touch on some of the work that's going on there and mention that um, mm -hmm. when we put things together and and create a. Uh, um, a communique. Um, I thought it was a little bit hard for me to see some of the semantics that might be involved in the ORL diagrams. It seems like it might be in the metadata quality, but I didn't really have enough information to know whether real semantic analysis was being used to judge the metadata quality as part of the rating. So that would be something that would be nice to know more about. And finally, I asked what impacts of FAIR principles had on the ORL effort. I saw it in a slide later on, but I wasn't sure whether any of the principles were being and methodologies associated with them were being applied. And in particular of those, how was the question of interoperability gauged 
And that becomes important because you've got some trusted data clearly. And the question is, that it, do you become a silo because other people have other trusted data that you might've sort of merge with and become interoperable with, and there'll be semantic issues with that. So um, sure. that those are my set of uh, comments and questions. Yeah, that's that's great, Gary. Uh, Karen, I'll, I'll just say a few things first and then uh, throw it over to you regarding uh, the, the, the nice thing about the ORL levels uh, is that it's a it's sort of a living, breathing, evolving thing. And so as we apply ORLs to various use cases, uh, we we are inviting input to how we might want to improve uh, the um, ORL levels and and what's looked at. Um, so it was initially driven by operations, uh, not really driven by the science uh, or um, any sort of uh, uh, clusters within ESIP. So it's the operators that are saying, what can we trust? What can't we trust? And so this is what evolved, basically um, move forward by the operations side of decision makers. But that's not where it should end, right? I mean, we really need to incorporate uh, folks like your group, Bob's data, you know, information quality cluster. Uh, it's really important. And we're, we shared that uh, survey one, two, three document with the information quality cluster and asked, hey, what else might we want to ask uh, people uh, so they can, so we can modify it and, and, and make it even stronger. Mm -hmm. So all your comments are great. And I think that we, we should capture them and, and um, see how we can take that next level. Because when you're working with operational folks, you know, you really, you're kind of spoon feeding them science data uh, that they can really use to make decisions. There's so much more out there. Um, and, and I think, you know, regarding becoming a silo, I, I hope not because the data sharing and collaboration environment is open to data sets that are OGC compliant or, or even, you know, maybe not OGC compliant that people want to use. Um, but it really does empower people to think about how their data can be served as a web service, which makes it open, not just to geo collaborate to share, but for others to incorporate into their own GIS decision-making uh, and situational awareness systems. Karen? Right, and I would say that uh, we're doing this collaboratively with the All Hazards Consortium, and uh, they have, in, in terms of the silos, uh, we have representatives from several sectors. Uh, cybersecurity is there. Uh, we have uh, the, the FEMA, or the emergency managers from several states. Uh, and uh, they have an opportunity to participate uh, in the exercises right. that both uh, do the training uh, regarding the various tools and how the data is used, as well as setting the ORL levels. So that's all part of that process. Uh, I thought your comment about FAIR data is, is a really good one. I'm not sure that we've actually looked at the criteria from the FAIR criteria. Uh, so the ORLs have a, a flow chart uh, addressing some of these uh, aspects, uh, obviously to me, uh, but I'm not sure that we've, uh, we've covered all of them. So I think that would be a, a good thing to take back. Uh, and just do a cross check on it. And uh, the other point you made, Gary, was about um, semantics. And uh, that's where I feel like uh, changing, uh, you know, taking the data that's going to be uh, displayed on a map and adding the semantics to it so that uh, someone who is not familiar with the data product and what they're actually seeing can get a proper interpretation for the use that they're uh, that they're using it for at that time. I think that's a big challenge. That um, um, I'm not quite sure entirely how we're going to address it, but that's <laughs> that's what we want to look at. If I could just make one small comment, the way that semantic harmonization cluster in ESIP, as well as others, are addressing some of this is to take the vocabularies and to harmonize them and put those into ontologies so that you don't have to do the work. You can to a harmonized vocabulary in an ontology that at least covers a number, a range of, a, of vocabularies and possibly yes. even a range 
of aligned ontologies. And that's sort of the best practice that we're trying to develop in the cluster, the semantic harmonization cluster in ESIP. So yeah. we can continue that discussion yeah. since we're in, in the same, same family. Now, and, and there are tools now to do that, right? Uh, software tools to, to, uh, to help in, in doing that process today. There are techniques that are supported by some tools, but it sort of starts with spreadsheets that get aligned. So it's simple enough for mm. people, the main people to uh -huh. participate in that with, the, with data and knowledge engineers supporting it. Great, great. Very good, Gary. Now, if there are not many other questions, I have some. One for Bob Downs quickly. Are these relevance updates automated? Or are they planned to be automated in future so that we know that the data are latest or relevant or more accurate? Bob? Yes, yeah, so, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, the information quality cluster has not automated the uh, elements uh, looking at, at uh, information quality throughout the data set life cycle. Uh, however, uh, well, what we've recently done, and this is an effort that's been led by Ge Peng, one of the co-chairs of the information quality cluster, is to work with the international community to develop, to develop uh, uh, guidelines for applying data quality uh, to make it uh, the representation and documentation of quality information uh, available uh, to the community. And um, I, I could put a link in the chat. We just put out a paper uh, last week on, on this. And so uh, th that might be uh, uh, interesting to, to uh, uh, some of you. I'll, uh, I'll stick the link for that paper in the, in the, in the chat in this way. Uh, Thank uh, you. And I'm copying all many of those chat links into our soap hub chat so that there is a record of those links as well uh, as in the recording. Bob uh, Roberto, Robert Roberto has a question. I have a couple more. Robert? I will mention that uh, Dave Jones had had to uh, move on to uh, his, his uh, next uh, event, which is out of town. So he uh, had to, to leave, but I'm, I'm uh, still here if there's any other questions we can address. Thank you, Karen, for staying on. There are some chat questions which I can certainly email you and Dave just so that we can have them follow on. But I do want to communicate the following. What I got from today was we as technologists were developing platforms, sensors, data management systems, metadata, access to create uh, data subsets, et cetera. But I see your efforts taking us to two or three levels beyond that and more useful levels for public where you are able to feed them into real time storms, events, disasters, long-term studies, more research, create new standards like OGC and uh, create some new inputs for sensors, like for soil moisture, there is potential for microwave radiometry, infrared observations, and even a simple horizontal visual range sensor, which would give you an idea of the extent of smoke and will help people uh, impacted by these kinds of things. So I see an outreach to different communities with your efforts. And we really appreciate, we appreciate your taking time for our community. And we hope we will give you some feedback over due course of time, some short term, some little later by engaging some of our community members in your efforts and vice versa. So, Unless there are more questions, I want to take this opportunity to thank Karen for old time's sake and for, for your efforts today, both. 
Thank you. And I, I will mention that uh, Robert uh, uh, Rovetto did put in the link to the paper that, uh, oh, Bob Downs put it in there. Yes, so uh, uh, that, that was a, a recent publication. So thanks for posting that in the chat. Well, thank you very much. Um, Dave apologizes for having to leave early, uh, but um, we appreciate uh, the time uh, that uh, uh, to, to kind of share what we're doing with the ESIP Federation. There's been quite a focus on uh, cross-domain collaboration. And I think this is an excellent example of uh, what ESIP uh, wants to do in our uh, collaborative efforts, which are really important for moving uh, our technology and data forward for uh, greater public use, especially, but also private sector and, uh, and throughout uh, the federal uh, data provisioning of, of this important information for, uh, for disasters response. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, my Chair, uh, Ken, you want to say anything in the closing or Gary? I want to thank you, Paul. One thing would be what is on tap for next week? Yes. Uh, next week is 13th and we have Andrew. Oh, no, sorry. It is a uh, I was having it on my fingertips. Now that you put me on the, if you look at the meeting page. Okay. The, the meeting page uh, for next week is not yet um, <clears throat> finished. So. Um, I unfortunately couldn't get Christoph Janowitz to present. Uh, yeah, we were hoping that Christoph. Yeah, would... they they would have been great for this uh, topic, and it would have been interesting to Karen and Dave too. But unfortunately, they have Thir gotten, gotten uh, busy with the uh, with uh, their proposals and such. Yeah, uh, we have we have a confirmed speaker for next week. On the twentieth, we have Andrew Doherty. Uh, Janovich did not reply. So I have sent a, as per Sri Ram, Ram Sri Ram's request, I have sent it to John Beverly to confirm. That is the status. Great. Thank you. Totally. Thanks. And we'll follow it up with the management committee, I mean the summit committee. So once again, many, many thanks. Uh, we can stop the recording if everybody says so. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.